Breton faces an almighty challenge. And to get a sense of just how big it is, you've got to start at the top. Oh, crumbs. This is the fourth road bridge, just north of Edinburgh. Here you want to hold on. It looks magnificent, but key parts of it are wearing out. And in the waters of the fourth below me, they're just laying the foundations for a brand new bridge. All over Britain, it's the same story. Much of the civil engineering that holds our country together is no longer up to the job. You see, Britain needs more than just a lick of paint. It needs some serious work. It won't be easy, it won't be cheap. But if we're ambitious for our future, there's no better time to get on with the job of building it than right now. So I'm out to discover why infrastructure is suddenly a hot topic. I'll show you how we've rediscovered the knack of pulling off those really big projects. And we'll see what lessons our history can teach us today. In this series, I'll be lifting the lid on the stunning engineering that's transforming Britain. I'll be finding out what still needs to be done and how on earth we're going to do it. Tucked away in a narrow corner of West London, in the shadow of the A40, is a remarkable project. It busts a myth that Britain can't pull off epic engineering. This is one of the most ambitious, most complex, most expensive infrastructure projects you'll find pretty well anywhere. This is just one site of Crossrail, the new East-West Railway right across London. Now, to get the measure of it, I've got an appointment with Phyllis, and I'm told she's not to be messed with. Phyllis is one of Crossrail's eight vast tunnel boring machines, which are about to worm their way under London. She's from Germany. She carries quite a lot of weight, and she costs 10 million pounds. But for that, you get a lot of tunneling. It's only when you see her teeth that you realize just what she's capable of. We've arrived at a bit of a moment, actually, because they've got this tunnel boring machine. Weighs a 1,000 tons, 150 meters long, just a few centimeters of clearance above it. And they've got to slowly inch it down towards the point at which it's actually going to dig. If you thought washing up liquid was just for the kitchen, think again. Phyllis and her colleague Ada are heading beneath Paddington Station, under Hyde Park, below the tightly packed streets of London's West End and out to Farringdon to the east. It's the big tunnelling drive for what will be the new fast line across London when it opens in 2018. You can talk about Crossrail being the biggest construction programme in Europe. It's 14.8 billion pounds. Uh, we're digging 50 kilometers of tunnels under London. And if you get on a train at Maidenhead and get off at Shenfields, then that's about 120 kilometers long. So this is, this is as big as they get. And as I enter the tunnel to see Phyllis in operation, I'm left in no doubt what an extraordinary machine she is. I really feel the temperature has warmed up, even though we're only about 50 metres in. Steve Parker is the construction manager for this stretch of Crossrail's tunnels. Boy, this is just, it's so enormous. I had no idea 
The one machine can be so big, it's incredible. And there, right in front of me, is the back of the cutter head itself. I mean, think about what it's doing. It's, it's carving out soil that probably hasn't seen the light of day since the Earth was created. The cutter head scythes its way through the clay. Behind it, tunnel engineers build a ring made up of eight concrete segments slotted into place to within a millimetre's precision. When that's done, the machine braces itself against the ring it's just built and pushes forward to start the process again. It's amazingly fast, isn't it? How fast you're moving. What, 100 metres? 100 metres a week? I'd like to think that we could double that because we're looking at the long average. The long average would be 100 metres a week. So to get the high output, we need certain months, weeks, with a higher output than that. But what's amazing is, you're doing, we're seeing that here. When it's all up and running, there'll be another one next door being done at the same yeah. speed. And then there are going to be other ones dotted around building other pieces of Crossrail simultaneously. Yes, there's another on Crossrail. There is eight machines in total. But this isn't just engineering for engineering's sake. Phyllis is on a much bigger mission. There's news today about the new Victoria Walthamstow Underground. Tunnelling has begun at a number of places. The line will take five years to complete. When people tunnelled under London in the past, they did it for a reason, to enable the city to keep growing. London must have people moving about in it freely, a movement which is as vital to its life as the circulation of the blood is vital to the human body. Today, the city's growing faster than ever. The population is expected to rise by nearly 2 million in the next 20 years. That is the real driving force behind Crossrail. So while London works and sleeps and parties, the new stations are taking shape. And Phyllis and Ada are on a mission to ensure the capital can continue to grow. I confess I love these big engineering projects. I've even stolen a ball of clay as a souvenir. I'll make a little ashtray out of it. We used to be world leaders at this, and we can clearly still do it when we put our minds to it. And here's my thought. Should we be doing a lot more of this kind of work? Now, I know I'm biased because I like it, but isn't there a case for investing two or three times as much in infrastructure? Simply to get Britain ready for the future. You see, infrastructure's all around us. It's the roads we drive on, the lines we commute on, and the energy that powers us. It's what makes Britain tick. And it's the flavor of the month right now. All our main political parties say we need more of it. But why? Well, our problem right now is that our infrastructure hasn't kept up with the changes that have been occurring around us. In fact, some of it is wearing out. Oh, my goodness. What a view. A little diddy train going over the fourth rail bridge. Here on the Firth of Forth, just north of Edinburgh, it's not the iconic Victorian rail bridge that's the problem, but the 20th century road bridge. And its story is a neat little tale about how our infrastructure was once world class, but hasn't kept pace with a changing world. Back in the post-war years, there was no road bridge here. Instead, there was a ferry a slow and cumbersome substitute in an age of speed. When will you be near me, darling, won't you make it soon? But that was a problem for the Scottish economy. The crossing was a vital link between Edinburgh and the north of Scotland, and plenty of time was wasted waiting for the boat to come in. 
Though so some found a way to while away the hours. The queues of cars, longer each year, were a visible argument of the need for a new bridge, a road bridge. Have you heard about that swinging road, the suspension bridge across the river? So, in the late 50s, construction started on a new road bridge. In a rather different era for health and safety. At the time, it was the biggest outside America, a symbol of Britain's skill at civil engineering. But here's the problem. The bridge was built with capacity for 12 million vehicles a year. It seemed like a wild overestimate back in the 1950s, but it hit that number 25 years ago. Today, the bridge carries more than 24 million vehicles a year, and it's showing the strain. The constant maintenance work is once again causing delays. So what are the kinds of problems that you're finding on this bridge now? It's corrosion in the main cable is, is an issue for us. Uh, but the deck itself has suffered with the heavy goods vehicles that have uh, been uh, passing over it every year. And we need to replace joints and components of the deck, which unfortunately means carriageway closures. And it's seen as such a critical uh, piece of infrastructure. It's probably worth about two billion pounds to the Scottish economy each year. So if this is out of action, then the Scottish economy is, uh, is severely hit. The Scottish government's decided it can't keep patching and mending the old bridge, and so it's starting anew. Soon, there'll be three bridges here, 19th century, 20th century, and 21st. The great news is that British bridge buildings moved on since the 1950s, and the new crossing will be a cable-stayed design, where the load is spread across multiple cables, rather than the two on the old suspension bridge. The advantages of a cable-stayed bridge is that it's stiffer. It's also easier to maintain because each of the individual cables that make the structure can be taken out and replaced while the bridge operates. I mean, when you imagine it's three kilometers from bank to bank, and the structure is this ribbon of five meters depth from one end to the other of continuous geometry, absolutely beautiful. In the last few months, the vast caissons have arrived, the big cylinders which they'll sink into the fourth to enable construction of the towers for the new bridge. They're the first pieces of Scotland's biggest infrastructure project for a generation. But there's another thing going for it too. Although it'll cost one and a half billion pounds, it's a useful fillip to the local economy at a difficult time. From the Rocky Canyon where the Columbia River rolls, Ever since America built vast projects like this, the Grand Coulee Dam, during the Great Depression of the 1930s, infrastructure's been seen as one of the most effective ways of creating jobs. Just about the biggest thing that man has ever done. Many believe that the historical lesson applies today, and Britain should be digging her way out of a slump. There's a big argument over that. Makes the tower of Whether we should build things to boost the economy. In any event, these projects aren't a quick fix. It's taken five years to get the new fourth bridge to where it is today, directly employing 1,200 people. Now, I wouldn't be one to argue that we should go around building bridges and tunnels simply to create jobs for construction workers. But if you know you've got to build one anyway, Doing so at a time when there are unemployed construction workers and when the economy is in the doldrums, well, that makes an awful lot of sense. The simple fact is, there's an awful lot more than bridge building to do, given the changes unfolding around us. Our population is growing fast. We're set to hit 70 million by 2030. In the late 1970s, one in four of us worked in manufacturing. 